So welcome back. Today we are going to talk about various deep reinforcement learning algorithms that have been proposed in the literature in the past uh, five or so years. Uh, of course, the history of reinforcement learning or rather deep reinforcement learning is quite old. People have been thinking about neural networks as function approximators for a very long time. Uh, but uh, there has been tremendous amount of progress in uh, understanding how to stabilize um, the reinforcement learning algorithms when the underlying function approximators for the value function, the Q function or the policy are represented through a deep neural network. So before we begin, I want to connect what we did in the previous uh, uh, lecture, which was on regression to uh, what we are going to do in RL. So remember, I want you to remember this figure. So you have your samples, say, ST, AT, RT. Uh, this goes into a regression algorithm that then tells you vt or qt that then goes into the rl block that gives you the policy mu t plus one that then goes into the simulator and the simulator then produces uh, implements that policy and then gives you a new set of samples of statrt so assuming that the value function or the q function are uh, parameterized with uh, parameter theta um, and this is your xt, how does the uh, function approximator behaves? Uh, so, so what's the training algorithm for the function approximator? So we'll assume the usual L2 norm. So we want to minimize, say z is the target value minus f theta x is the uh, original value. And I want to minimize with respect to theta in Rn, and I'm going to take a squared loss. So squared loss is the most commonly used loss because the derivatives are much easier to compute for squared loss. So if I want to do this minimization, how would I do it? Well, I mean, the typical idea is to use gradient descent. So let's try to find the derivative. of this uh, objective function. So let me call this j of theta. It's uh, maybe I'll divide it by half. OK, so how do I uh, compute the derivative? So this is 1 over 2 multiplied by 2 multiplied by z minus f theta x multiplied by gradient of theta of f theta x. OK, so this is, oh, sorry, there should be a negative sign also. OK, so this is minus z minus f theta x of gradient theta f theta x. And so the gradient descent algorithm will be theta k plus 1 equals to theta k plus eta, which is the learning rate, eta k. Um, z minus f theta x gradient theta f theta x so this is the error uh, which we want to minimize so you have the step size so remember you have a positive sign here because you have a negative and then that negative combines with this negative to become a positive eta k is the learning rate or step size this is the error that we want to minimize, and this is the gradient of f with respect to theta uh, evaluated at the point x. So we'll soon see how this um, this algorithm is used this uh, to train the value of theta, which is required for within this regression box. Uh, now, of course, I'm not saying that you. So one thing to note here is that you can pick any. Um, error function here you doesn't necessarily have to be the l2 norm but in the context of neural networks this is ex this is what i've been seeing across all the papers uh, perhaps picking a different loss functions can give you a different um, a, a different uh, derivative here which may or may not make the uh, the training stable uh, i mean i just don't know because i don't have the practical experience to 
working on neural network type problems or neural network type function approximators. Uh, but certainly you should, if you are um, adventurous, you can perhaps try different loss functions that uh, uh, here and then the corresponding derivative uh, when you are training the values of theta in order to do the regression. So this algorithm is basically, this update rule is basically used in this regression block. Uh, sometimes it's also used in the RL block if your mu, theta, mu, which is the policy, is also parameterized with theta. So sometimes it's also used in the RL block when the policy is also parameterized. So except that the f theta, so in the case of uh, value function, f will be v theta and this will be the value we would like it to have and this is the current value that we have computed so this is the error um, and and uh, this f will be actually the value function as a function of x the s the so x will be x will be the state f will be the value function and theta will be the parameterization for the value function in the case of q function x will be the state action pair uh, f will be the q function and uh, this will be of course the error in the q function and in the case of policy uh, f will be the total cost as a function of policy um, sorry uh, well j will be the total cost as a function of policy And you are trying to minimize um, uh, the the total cost by picking an appropriate uh, value of uh, parameterization for the policy. So with that, uh, let me go over all the notations that we will be using in this section and uh, the subsequent section. So S is usually the would be denoted would denote the state space and st would be the state at time t a will be the action space at will be the action at time t rt will be the reward that is received at time t uh, q function will be denoted by q value function will be denoted by value v uh, policies would typically be denoted by mu and pi and this would map the state space to uh, probability distribution over the action space The discount factor would be either alpha or gamma. These are the two usual symbols for discount factors in reinforcement learning. Q pi would be the Q function under policy pi. So you fix the policy and you want to evaluate what the Q function is for that particular policy. Similarly, V pi would be the value function under policy pi. Uh, the state transition kernel would be denoted by this uh, uh, P uh, and it would be a conditional measure. And then the operators that we have um, talked about previously. So Bellman operator, which is uh, an, an operator from the space of value functions to the space of value functions given by this expression. Uh, then we extend the same uh, operator to the space of Q functions to the space of Q functions by considering essentially the same thing without the max. So the max essentially is now in computing the value at the next state okay and then in temporal differences remember the temporal differences were uh, used for evaluating the value or policy value or q function at a specific policy so at is always picked according to some policy pi um, the temporal difference dt is a function of st and st plus one and it's this it's given by the reward plus alpha, which is the discount factor multiplied by the value at the next state minus the value at the current state. So typically these will all be parameterized functions V. And so based on the parameters, you will evaluate what these differences is, what the temporal difference is. Uh, similarly, if you want to use the uh, pi to compute the Q values, it would be given by this particular expression. So RT plus alpha Q minus Q. Um, 
Uh, now, of course, sometimes you want to use temporal differences in the Q space to compute the value function and vice versa. So you will have to put a max here if you want to somehow correlate the temporal differences with respect to Q to temporal differences with respect to value. So there are many algorithms within reinforcement learning where the policy pi, value V and Q function, all three of them are parameterized and all three of them change over the course of training of reinforcement learning. So I'll give you the precise expressions when we talk about some of those algorithms. So with this, uh, everything is set. Now let's talk about uh, experience replay, which is uh, one of the most widely used technique in reinforcement learning now. And the idea of experience replay is as follows. So remember, uh, when we were talking about the Q learning, the idea was that Q of T plus one, this was the finite state setting, finite state, finite action. So QT plus one of ST AT was given by one minus eta T QT ST comma AT plus eta T RT plus alpha max A prime QT of ST plus one comma a prime okay and once you have used the sample st at rt you kind of uh, forget it you you don't use it again so this leads to sample inefficiency so samples are used only once and then discarded so this leads to sample inefficiency what that means is in efficiency what that means is that uh, you would need perhaps a billion or a trillion samples to train an algorithm and you would want to figure out if uh, you could achieve a similar performance by using perhaps only a million samples so that would improve your sample efficiency and what it means for your actual algorithm is that the runtime will be much lower because now you can only you can get a similar performance with only a million samples. Um, so how do you improve the sample efficiency? So one of the ideas that was proposed in Lin 1992 paper was to uh, do what is known as experience replay. So you have your ST, AT, so let me start with S0, A0, S1, R1, S1, A1, S2, R2, and so on, all the way to ST, AT, ST plus 1, RT. So you have accumulated all these samples from your simulator. Um, what you can do is instead of just using the latest sample for computing the Q function, that, that is what you did here. That is exactly what you did here. Um, let's try and pick IID samples from this whole history that you have accumulated and update the Q functions using all those samples. Okay, so a possible training in that situation would be, uh, you pick IID samples, uh, and then you update your Q function as one minus um, so let, let's pick some IID samples, S0, A0, S1, R1, S2, A2, S3, R2, S100, A100, S101, 
R100. Okay, so I picked three samples and now I'm going to update the Q function for all these three samples. So Q of T plus one of S comma A will have the corresponding update for S0, A0, S2, A2 and S100, A100. So each sample is basically used several times in the update of the Q function. And of course, you want to pick, um, uh, you don't want to use all the samples all the time, but you definitely want to pick samples so that they emulate almost IID experiences. Uh, in, in, so, so what I'm saying is these, these values are all correlated because they are coming through a Markov process, but by picking IID samples across time, you try to decorrelate them a little bit. Um, so naturally, S0, A0, S1, R1 is going to be correlated with this value, but it will have very little correlation with this, this value. So, so you use this uh, sort of uncorrelated values. So if you pick I, in an IID fashion from your experience, you sort of uncorrelate these values and then you update it in your Q function appropriately and thereby improve the sample efficiency. Okay, so that was the idea proposed in 1992. Now, this idea was further extended for the case of neural networks in what is now known as prioritized experience replay. And it is something that pretty much every neural network, um, sorry, every uh, deep reinforcement learning algorithm now uses. So the idea in prioritized experience replay is to, so remember we had this experience So I have this experience and in the previous uh, situation, I told you to pick uh, these uh, these values of uh, or these tuples in an IID fashion. Now in prioritized experience replay, you want to pick some samples um, more aggressively than others. Okay, so some samples will have higher probability of picking and other samples will have a lower priority of picking. So how do you decide which samples should get higher priority? So a natural way to figure out which samples should be picked with higher uh, probability is to look at the temporal difference. So D uh, T, which is R T plus alpha V T st plus one minus vt st or perhaps the corresponding q values so you want to pick you want the probability p t to be directly proportional to absolute value of dt so if your temporal difference is high at a particular state action pair or at a particular state then you want to um, use those samples more often and you want to use other samples less often because your function definitely fits. Uh, I want to make sure that I write theta here because these are all neural networks. Uh, so theta denotes the weights of the neural network. So you want to pick uh, samples that have higher temporal differences or absolute value of temporal differences. Then you want to pick them with higher probability. And not only that, you want to weigh them when you are doing the, um, when you're doing the update, you want to weigh them with respect to WT, which is directly proportional to PT. Uh, maybe I should write it DT raised to alpha and PT raised to beta or PT raised to minus beta. So where alpha is 0 0.5, beta is 0 0.6 to 0 0.7. Let's, let's say one. So basically you start with a small value of beta, maybe beta around 0 0.6, and then you increase it to one as uh, T progresses, as the algorithm progresses. Okay, so 
then the update would be your theta k plus 1 equals to theta k plus eta k which is the step size multiplied by wt multiplied by the temporal difference dt multiplied by gradient of theta of v theta st or in the case of q function it will be q theta st so this is the idea of uh, prioritized experience replay so i'm going to show you how it works for the dq double dqn algorithm so double dqn algorithm is something we'll talk about in maybe five minutes from now so it's written in that context but i just wanted to give you what the essential idea is which is the probability depends probability is proportional to the temporal difference raised to alpha and the weight so remember this is what you would be doing if you were doing a regular gradient descent but now you add an important sampling weight wt uh, in this particular fashion so that your training is uh, somewhat um, uh, stable so what is this algorithm so um, again i apologize for a different notation so all papers pick completely different notation and it's very hard to keep track of what is what um, so here this is the probability of picking so j j is the time index okay so um, this is pj raised to alpha over sum of p pi raised to alpha for all the i's in the experience so this is one experience or rather i should say recent experience you know these are all for playing games um, you know these algorithms were designed to play games and therefore you know once the game finishes you can't get more experience so therefore you know they are their experiences are slotted so sometimes the game gets over and so you have to work with the data uh, that you receive within that particular experience so anyways uh, uh, this is this shows that the probability of picking a specific transition is uh, directly proportional to p uh, raised to alpha where pj is updated here based on the temporal difference this is the temporal difference that they have um, so you will notice that there is a q target and a q function so these two q functions are completely different uh, and we will talk about why they are different in the double deep q learning uh, double dqn uh, in the future in ne next five minutes um, and then this is the important sampling weight that i was talking about uh, so this is directly proportional to p raised to minus beta and then this n is the number of samples you're picking and the max is the maximum weight of all the samples that you have picked so far so this is the overall idea of uh, uh, prioritized experience replay so i want to go over it once more so you look at the temporal difference um, your probability of picking in a, a specific tuple is directly proportional to the absolute value of temporal difference raised to alpha then you put some important sampling weight which is pt raised to minus beta and then you update your theta k in this particular fashion so this is for the double dqn but you can use it for any other uh, 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 any other type of function approximation as you like so what are the commonly used uh, deep reinforcement learning framework so we just talked about dqn so there are there are a lot of things you can do uh, so one is a uh, value based value iteration based another is Q, Q function based okay and then the third one would be SARSA based okay so remember Q function was this is uh, model free uh, of policy this is model free on policy this is of course model based 
and the policy doesn't matter okay because you are running the value iteration for all possible state action pairs um, so this is so so in in the case of uh, deep reinforcement learning your value functions could be a deep neural network or your q function could be a deep neural network or your policy could be a deep neural network and then you have the actor critic framework where you have an actor that emits the policy mu and then you have a critic that evaluates the policy and gives you either v mu or q mu okay or some approximation thereof um, and uh, typically in actor critic framework both mu depends on some neural network so mu would be uh, approximated using a neural network and then of course v mu and q mu would also be approximated using a neural network and typically what happens in the actor critic framework so remember in the earlier classes in i think lecture six six to eight Uh, we had talked about the actor critic framework where the idea was you evaluate the policy mu either using td lambda or some other approach um, and then you update the policy mu uh, based on uh, the one step bellman operator uh, on the other hand in this uh, situation you can't really expect to evaluate the policy mu because it's going to take you a long long time to evaluate it so what you do is you perhaps uh, pick a few samples uh, from the simulator um, using the policy mu and then you update your v mu and q mu and then you use that to compute a new policy mu tilde or mu t plus one and then you go over the same cycle again so essentially you're not really running you're not ev really evaluating v mu or q mu at all you are just running a couple of uh, not a couple but a few gradient descent steps and then you go on updating the policy and then go back to updating the value and q functions again so let's look at one of the simplest one which is deep q learning and in the deep q learning algorithm your q function is a function of theta and of course it's s a and remember uh, and this is what you want to compute so how do you compute it well you get some sample let's say uh, let me write it in terms of z and x so your x is st comma at your z is z is one minus RT plus gamma max A prime Q of ST plus one comma A prime. Sorry, I should use alpha because we have been using alpha for the discount factor minus this is theta theta ST. 80 uh, okay so this is the target value and then i want to minimize z minus q theta x square one half and minimize with respect to theta and this leads me to the update scheme qk plus one equals to sorry theta k plus one equals to theta k uh, my q and theta look similar so that's not good theta k plus eta k z minus q theta x into gradient of theta q theta x okay this is the vanilla q learning uh, it will never work if you're using neural network as function approximator unless you use some of the prioritized experience replay idea that we have talked about 
and uh, uh, and use some of the other techniques that we will be talking about in the subsequent lectures. Uh, but this is the original idea of deep queue learning. And there were a lot of problems with being able to train the algorithm based on just this particular idea because it uh, um, because it wasn't stable and it wasn't giving you cons giving consistent results. So that's why people came up with what is known as double deep queue learning. So DDQ DD Q learning. So this is double. DQN. So the original idea of double deep queue learning was, I think, proposed in 2010. Oh, sorry, it wasn't double deep queue learning, it was just double queue learning. Okay, so this was the idea. Uh, you have two queue functions, QA and QB, and uh, you choose an action A based on this or this and then you observe the reward in S prime, then you can choose to update either A or update QB. If update A, then you uh, then you update your QA in this fashion, uh, and if you are updating B, then you update QB in this fashion, and then you uh, go through this whole cycle again and again. Um, now, uh, this was supposed to have this this basically improved the performance of the queue learning so this is known as double queue learning and this was in the finite state action setting now um, the double deep queue dqn algorithm which i think came around 2015 and most of these algorithms that i'm going to talk about came from google researchers from google or deepmind which now is part of Google or Google Brain, which is of course part of Google. So, so a lot of uh, development has happened in in Google for some of these algorithms that we are talking about. At least in the public domain, these papers are coming from Google's research group. So, the idea in double DQN is as follows. So, instead of keeping two different QA and QB, which will be very disastrous because you will have to update two different neural networks at every point of time, not at every point of time, but you'll have to pick between one of those two neural networks. So, what they do is your QB is an older version of QA. Okay, so that's one change. And the second change is uh, there is no update B step, no update B step. So that is the step eight is not there. Okay, so what they do is basically they have a single neural network um, to approximate the Q function. And then of course they go through this, this thing changes to a regression problem. rather a gradient descent with uh, uh, algorithm and that we have just talked about in the context of deep queue learning. But what they do is uh, the, the QB, so remember this, when you are updating QA, you are picking QB here. So this QB is, so you update QB every so often. So after maybe every 100 or 200 or 500 iterations, you uh, use the weights of QA and you transfer it to QB. Okay, so after every 100 slash 200 slash 500 iterations, copy QA's weights as QB weights. Okay, or, or rather the, I don't want to write it imprecisely, so the, the theta of the weights of QB 
is set to be equal to theta of QA, so theta A and theta B. Okay, um, and then you continue training of QA, and then again after 200 iterations, you copy all the weights of QA into the weights of QB, and you continue to do do this uh, forever, and that's known as the double DQN algorithm. This is the double DQN algorithm. And um, the prioritized experience replay was uh, was basically talking about prioritized experience replay in double DQN. So prioritized experience replay uh, was defined for Now, of course, uh, you might argue that why why to think about it only from a neural network perspective, perhaps even if you're using some other function approximator, you can do the same thing. And I think you would be absolutely correct. You should perhaps try some of these things and see whether uh, even if you're using some other function approximator, such a thing will help you or not. Uh, what I do, what I can tell you is that at tw in 2015, uh, double DQN plus prioritized experience replay was the state of the art. That was the best algorithm available at that time for uh, uh, deep reinforcement learning. Then uh, after some time, people thought about um, uh, a different way of representing a cube function. So let's let's think about it in the following way. So I have a cube function. which is a function of s and a, I can write it as q as a function of s a minus max over a prime of q s comma a prime plus v of s, okay? And remember that v of s is actually equal to max over a prime of q of s comma a prime okay so this uh, so this uh, expression is is valid so let me let me copy and paste it again Okay, so now let me do the following. I'm going to call this an advantage function. So this is a new terminology, advantage function, a of s comma a, and this is of course the value function. Okay. Now, if you separate your value function and advantage function, um, so separate your Q function into sum of an advantage function and a value function, then the goal is instead of trying to parameterize only Q with respect to theta, you can now parameterize A with respect to theta A, which is uh, the neural network for uh, the advantage function, and then you can represent the value function using some other neural network. So the idea here now is that you have your input layer, which is the states, and then you go through a bunch of hidden layers, and then you have, then you branch out, you have two layers, uh, okay, and then this gives you your a S A, and this gives you V of S. Okay, so this gives this will be outputting a scalar value, and this will be outputting the advantage function, and so the number of outputs will be equal to the number of actions you have. So this is the idea of uh, what is known as dueling architecture using value and advantage function. Okay. Uh, 
So, so some part of the neural network of the advanced the estimate for the advantage function and the value function is the same. Okay, so this part is the same. Whereas uh, in the final layer or final few layers, you sort of separate the two networks and you compute the advantage function separately from the value function. Okay, so this is the idea of, this is known as dueling architecture, okay, dueling architecture, because it gives you advantage function and value function. And then you apply the usual uh, reinforcement learning techniques to um, to compute the, uh, the optimal advantage values and optimal value, uh, value function. So with this, uh, we end our uh, discussion on deep reinforcement learning. In the next lecture, we'll talk about actor critic architecture for a brief amount of time. And then we'll move on to MDPs with a generative model. Thank you.